the intercept people in Britain uh, were very used to listening to the did did da of Morse code. They knew this was enigma. And then one day in 1940 or 1941, they heard what they called a strange new music coming through their headphones. It sounded completely different to Morse code. It was based on two tones and it made a kind of burbling sound, a high-speed burbling sound as it was transmitted. One must realize that the Enigma machine was an entirely conventional machine. We could have made an Enigma in 1900. At the beginning of World War II, the Germans undertook the building of more modern and much more sophisticated encryption machines, including the most well-known, built by the Standard Electric Lorenz Company, and which the English codenamed Tuni. Tuni, a nickname for tuna. Unlike Dolphin and Shark, the code names for the naval Enigma, Tuni wasn't based on Morse code, but on the digital code used by teletypewriters. Without ever having seen one, the cryptographers from the research department were able to discover the logical structure of the mysterious machine, and they would soon be able to build a replica. But like Enigma, possessing the machine wasn't enough to break the code, and by the fall of 1942, Turing was called to the rescue. In just a few weeks, he found a way to crack the Tuny messages, a discovery that would play a major role almost immediately on the Russian front. In the summer of 1943, after the German army's defeat at Stalingrad, Hitler tried to retake the initiative by moving troops and tanks towards the Russian city of Kursk. Much planning went into this attack, and the planning, the discussions between Hitler and his generals was all carried out on Tunney. Um, so Bletchley Park was reading what Hitler was saying to his generals, what the generals at the at the, um, at the Russian front were saying back to Hitler. And so they managed to discover practically everything about the German plans for Kursk. This information, promptly transmitted to Moscow, enabled the Russians to triumph in the largest tank battle in history and start their victorious advance towards Berlin. But the volume of Tuny messages was constantly increasing, and Turing's method, which relied on the intuition of the cryptographers, was manual, thus too slow. Once again, it would require a machine. However, the bombs were now old technology. Something new was needed. And what Turing found this time was an engineer called Tommy Flowers. Flowers was a specialist in electronics, an emerging technology based on vacuum tubes or valves. Appliances at the time had just a few valves, at most a few dozen. But Flowers wanted to build a machine with 2,000 of them. There was a belief amongst engineers that valves were too unreliable to be used in large numbers. You could use a couple of dozen, but the idea of using a couple of thousand, um, people believed was crazy. So they said thanks, but no thanks to Flowers. But Flowers was a determined man. He knew he was right. So he went back to his own laboratory in North London, and he quietly got on with building the all electronic machine that he knew the code breakers needed. Flowers' machine was so gigantic that he had it nicknamed Colossus. Turing was thrilled with its performance. His dream of machine intelligence suddenly seemed much less of a dream. It is customary in a talk or article on this subject to offer a grain of comfort in the form of a statement that some particularly human characteristic could never be imitated by a machine. 
It might, for instance, be said that no machine could write good English, or that it could not be influenced by sex appeal or smoke a pipe. I cannot offer such comfort, for I believe that no such bounds can be set. Beginning in February 1944, Colossus automatically decrypted the communications exchanged at the highest level of the German general staff. Infiltrated at the heart of their communications, the Allies were poised to launch the biggest hoax of World War II, the famous Operation Fortitude. Operation Fortitude was uh, conducted well before the D-Day landings of June 1944, and its aim was to persuade the Germans that the landing was going to take place not in Normandy where it did, but much further east in the Pas de Calais area. What it did was to give the Germans the idea that that was where we were going. Now, we were able to monitor that and to tune it, to fine tune it successfully in fortitude because we were able to intercept their strategic high-level communications, which made it clear that the deception was working and working very well. What followed is well known, having been narrated, filmed, photographed up and down, and reenacted dozens of times in the cinema. On the dawn of June the 6th, Alan Turing heard the news at the same time as everyone else. The landing operations had begun. Hitler didn't respond fully to the Normandy invasion. He held his forces in reserve, waiting for the Calais invasion. So the Allied commanders knew that they had some breathing space at Normandy before the full German forces were flung at them. And if they'd been there at the Normandy beaches to start off with, the story might have gone quite differently. For Harry Hinsley, a veteran of Bletchley Park who became a historian specialised in codes, the decryption operations helped considerably to shorten World War II. Several times he went into print as saying that he thought uh, ultra shortened the war by two years. I think we have to see this as being a symbolic calculation. One just has to see them as being very important helping things. Harry Hinsley also went on to say that one of the consequences, had the war not ended in May 1945, would probably have been that the first atomic weapon would not have been dropped on Japan, but on Berlin. There would be no atomic bomb dropped on Berlin. On May the 8th, 1945, cheering crowds throughout Europe celebrated the Allied victory over Nazi Germany. Turing no doubt deserved to be celebrated at the side of the royal family and be treated as a national hero. Instead, he would disappear completely from official history. The victory was celebrated at Bletchley Park as well, but neither Turing nor Tommy Flowers nor anyone else could lay claim to the great progress that had been made there. Military secrecy was still the order of the day. On the still smoking ruins covering Europe, the Cold War had already begun. As the German forces retreated at the end of the war, they left tiny machines behind them all over Europe. The Russians, as they advanced, were capturing tiny machines. And the Russians reconditioned these machines, changed them in various ways, and used them to encode their own messages. So Tunney um, transitioned the defeat of Germany. Um, the language changed, but the Tunney machines just carried on. 